it's impossible for me, but not for God. Remember last week I talked about it's impossible, but uh, I'm expanding a little bit and say it's impossible for me, but not for God. No, I don't have that. I better turn that on. There we go. It's impossible for me, but not for God. You know, I, it, it's interesting how we think through this these things, but uh, when we talk about praise and worship, and, uh, I'll tell you, for the last couple of weeks, um, ever since that pastor, uh, the, the potential for me to go to that church of 5,000 came up. Um, they have two services. One, I think, has 2,000, one has 3,000 people in it. And, and um, I was kind of excited because it says, you know, that, uh, that, that, you know, I had that prophecy in Columbia, Missouri, where the lady, the, the missionary from Africa came and, uh, and, uh, and told me that she had a prophecy that I, I would have this message go before thousands. And then a few minutes later, at the same church, another woman came up to me and said the same thing. And, um, you know, what a confirmation that is. And my first reaction, I want you to think about this a little bit. My first reaction was, um, wow, this is incredible. This message is going to go out to thousands of people. It's, you know, it's such a call to intimacy with Christ. that It's going to go out to thousands of people. And, and it probably it already has gone out to thousands, if you think about it. But, but gone to 34 states out of 50 so far. And, um, and I'm sure that probably adds up to a thousand people. But... Um, it, it, it's uh, my first reaction was, "Wow, this is great! I'm excited." So uh, I have been able to sleep really for the last uh, two weeks. And, and in this sense, uh, I went on his website, and, and most of the time he speaks, he speaks about 31 to 35 minutes. And um, and then I watched some of the guests he's had, and he's had some pretty famous guests um, speaking on there, and they spoke. The longest one, I think, was 41, 42 minutes. And uh, so I, I think I have about 40 minutes. And so I've been practicing in it. And I, I look over at my clock. I'm laying in bed. I look over at my clock, and it says, uh, you know, it says 1.15. You know, so I, I start going through the message in my head. And I look over the clock, and, and, and I'm just getting to, uh, probably just getting to about Jericho in 45 minutes, you know. It's 2 o'clock. So I start again and think, well, let's see how far I can get by, you know, 2.45, and I, I do it again. I've been doing that over and over every night for, I, I, I just haven't even been sleeping. I did it last night, did it the night before, I've just been doing it over and over, trying to get it down to 40 minutes. Sometimes I fall asleep and I wake up and it's been an hour and I go, oh, shoot, I didn't finish an hour. Um, I, I really want to do that, speak before a thousand people, uh, not because of me, you know, I don't think it's because of me, or I mean, that's the right thing to say. It's not because of me, but you know, I, we never really know our own motivation. I don't think sometimes. <clears throat> but um, I'm going to read you something from this book in a minute. Um, the Achieving Faith. I actually left this in a motel, and they just mailed it back to me. But um, Achieving Faith by J. G. Morrison, one of the leaders in the in the Nazarene Church. They don't believe. Leaders in the founding of the Nazarene Church, they don't believe the same way we do with regards to speaking in tongues exactly. They just see it as a gift, but they don't see it as something that's for everybody. But uh, in one of the chapters that I just read, um, <coughs> spoke about George Mueller. Is, is you guys know who George Mueller is? <coughs> Faintly. Well, <coughs> George Mueller was a famous English uh, preacher. <clears throat> and uh, at some point the Lord spoke to him and, and changed his direction from a traditional church to an outreach strictly for orphaned kids. And I, I don't know if it was during the, during the plague or when it was exactly, but uh, I always spoil everybody, you know, with, with the plague. I don't know if you, have you ever heard that little thing that says, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes all fall down. That's such a cute little song, but you know how it started? It started with the plague. And uh, I, w I won't repeat it because you're all nodding your head. You've heard it before. But so I, I don't know if the if it was during the plague or exactly when it was. I, I'm not really researched it. I've, I've read a lot of stuff that's been written about him. He didn't write much of his own. I think his son-in-law or somebody um, <coughs> accumulated what books are, are given to his authorship. But um, 
But I, I read something in this book that I hadn't realized before. It said when George Mueller found out that the Lord was going to have him uh, take care of children and develop a large orphanage for kids, um, he, he knew that it was going to take a lot of money and, and, and things that would have to come from who knows where because the kids weren't going to bring it in, obviously. Yeah, just to feed the kids and care for them and you know, keep them housed and, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> But he, but he knew in his heart, he knew that he knew that if the Lord called you to that, then the Lord would actually provide whatever is necessary for that. So the first thing that George Mueller did when he realized, okay, God said to do this, that means God's going to give me, you know, incredible resources for these kids. <clears throat> Excuse me, he thought this through. The more kids I get, then the more resources I need, and it's just, and the kids are going to come, people are going to bring the kids, kids are going to come, the orphanage is going to grow, which means God is going to give me, <clears throat> he's going to give me lots and lots of stuff. So immediately, he took that as a warning, and he began to get on his face before God, and he said he would not start the orphanage until he was sufficiently crucified. That is, the Lord brought this stuff in and did these miracles. And, and if you've ever heard of some of his miracles, I mean, you know, dairy, they'd be out of milk and, and the dairy truck would show up and say, you know, my, my refrigerator unit broke or whatever it was on the truck and I can't deliver my milk or, or the bridge is out and I can't deliver my milk. Can you take all this milk? You know, and there'd be milk. And, and you know, and people would show up at the door with with, with uh, bags of oatmeal and stuff like that. I mean, huge, you know, like, you know, trucks full of oatmeal. And, and, uh, and I don't know if it was trucks in those days or if it was horse-drawn carriages, but they'd show up with this stuff and say, <clears throat> you know, something's happened that I can't deliver it. Can you take it? You know, and, and this happened every day. Every day, farmers would show up with chickens and eggs and said, you know, I brought my chickens in and I can't deliver them. And, you know, <clears throat> And, and whatever, every day this happened. But George Mueller had told the Lord, I will not go into this ministry because I know how you love kids and I know how you're going to provide for kids. I will not go into this ministry until I'm sufficiently dead that George Mueller will never take a bit of credit for what God has done. And, and I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, because of this, I, how many people, I, I was just thinking of the Michelangelo uh, painting that we have in the back uh, of, of him, you know, the hand touching. And, um, and, and I thought to myself, how many, how many great artists and great painters and great publicists and never got famous until they were dead? And, and I thought that's interesting, isn't it? They never got famous until they're dead. George Mueller couldn't wait till he was dead, dead to do this because it had to be accomplished. And he knew that fame would come with it as, as God blessed him in this endeavor. So he, he made sure he was dead before it happened. But so often in the world, people are not famous until they're dead. Because you know what? They couldn't handle the fame. They wouldn't be able to handle the fame. And, and that's demonstrated by the fact that look at Hollywood today. These people rise up as, as incredibly famous people. They have people idolizing them, people listening to their, to their political views, everything else. And these people are shallow and, and, they're, and they're whimsical and they're, 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 they're just flimsy character, flimsy personality. They, they end up divorced. And I mean, even somebody like Warren Buffett, who is, is thought to be so solid and famous, divorced his wife and, and because he was cheating on, on, on her with the, the house cleaner. You know, and, 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 um, and he gives money, he gives tons of money to, to abortion and all this stuff. And had he not got famous till he was dead, his stock investment system had not gotten famous till he was dead, he may not have done those things. He may not have given, you know, tons of money to, to abortion, tons of money to, to uh, liberal communist uh, political parties and stuff like that. And if, if, if all his wealth and everything hadn't come until he was dead, he'd been better off. And we have an opportunity as Christians to be dead so that God can work great things through us. You know, Billy Graham's about to do that thing, is it this coming Saturday? Or, oh, it was last night, he did it last night. I, I didn't get to see it. Did anybody see it? You got to see it. He's 95 years old and he's about dead and he wanted to leave us with the truth, he said. I, I think that's, 
interesting. I wish I'd, I'd known it was on. I would have watched it. I, I don't watch much TV, so I didn't know when it was going to be on, but I, I'd seen some fleeting commercials about it. But uh, um, hopefully that impacted a lot of people. I'm sure that's his, his hope at 95 years old to impact, make one great grand impact on people. And I, I think he's remained reasonably humble. I, I guess I don't think he's, you know, taken great advantage of it or anything like that, uh, of his fame. And uh, and then I was thinking, I was thinking, I had this prophecy, and I want you to think about this is for me, but I mean, I want you to think about yourselves too. I had this prophecy that I would speak before thousands, that this message wasn't just for small churches, the, that the message was for thousands, and, and I was going to have the opportunity to speak for thousands. My, my initial reaction to that was that, wow, incredible God, I can't wait, you know, this is pretty cool and all that. And then after reading this thing with George Mueller, I got to thinking, that, that, that message that I took, that prophecy that I took as, uh, as one to, to kind of give me hope and to look forward to what, what I was doing, I, I realized my perspective was completely wrong. That lady that came and prophesied to me about thousands, that was a warning. That was a warning for me to begin to prepare myself so that when it happened, and, and I say when, I, I want you to think about this because two things went through my mind. One, if God loved those kids so much that he provided everything George Mueller needed to, to take care of those kids, God so loves America, God so loves America, that that message will get to America. That message will get to America. And so I'm confident that this message is going to go to thousands. I'm confident that this message will go to thousands. I'm confident that God will begin to, to uh, establish a healing ministry um, through, that, through that ministry. And, uh, and hopefully I'm part of it. You know, when I pray for people like Devin, you know, and, and I want to see him miraculously change. But one of the questions might be, am I prepared as an individual that if those things began to happen, could I, could I handle them? And could I become more and more and more humble? And, and I, I think back to probably one of the most uh, startling experiences I've had, and I've mentioned this before, is I was talking to Pastor Jim Simbley. He and I were having brunch together in his conference room. And, and as it happened, he had to, go to the, had to go to his office to counsel somebody, and I had to go to the restroom. And, and, uh, and as he was done counseling, I was done, and, and we ran into each other in this little tiny narrow hallway between his office and this large conference room. His conference room is probably as big as our church. But, um, and I, I just turned to him and I said, thank you. Thank you for, uh, actually, he, he had, uh, his daughter and son-in-law had come and, and been the pastors at our church for a while. And, and uh, I just thanked him. I said, I know that's a great sacrifice being a grandfather myself. I said, thank you for, uh, you know, allowing them to come because he could have so easily offered them something there at the church and they ended up actually going back to his senior associate. But, but, you know, I was just, it was just a kind word. You know, I, I just said a kind word. And he just absolutely jumped down my throat. He just jumped down my throat. And he says, don't you ever ascribe to me the decisions that God has made. He said, that is not, don't ever ascribe to me the benevolence of God. God sent them there. I didn't send them there. God allowed them to go. I didn't allow or disallow them to go there. And, and it just startled me. He did not want to take the least tiny bit of glory from anything that God had done. He, he did not want any glory at all for what God had done. And, and I'm not quoting his words exactly, but the message that he sent to me is, this isn't me. This is God that's doing what's happening here. This isn't, this isn't me that's, that's making the Brooklyn Tavern. This is, this is God operating through a humble servant. It isn't me that sent those people to bless you, you know, or prevent them from coming to bless you. It's strictly God. And I had that, that fortunate experience and, and it's, it's made a mark in my life, but I don't know that it's made the difference that it needs to make if I'm going to go to take this message to quote thousands. Am I to that place that I'm dead enough, that I'm crucified enough? 
And I think it's interesting that we're going through on Tuesday nights the thing with Andrew Womack where he said, you know, we're trying to find God's will for your life. And he says God's will is right in, in Romans 12 where it says, you know, uh, you become a living sacrifice. That's if, if God has you as a living sacrifice, if you're, if you're dead to yourself, if you're crucified like uh, Mueller was, um, and apparently like uh, Jim Simba is, if I can somehow get there, then maybe God can work uh, through me in those ways. So it, this last this last several months, I've been going through some things that that's really been humbling me, and and, uh, and I, you know, so pray that I, I have a clean, pure life, and that I. If you pray for your pastor, pray that I have a clean, pure life and that I'd be so crucified that when God begins to do this, it, it's not going to be me at all. I, I, really, I really desire that. And, and, you know, there's been some pastors that have fallen, you know, over the last, over the last years, famous ones like Swaggart and, and uh, Baker and then, of course, uh, in Colorado Springs. But um, it, it, it's... These guys have ridden to great, great places, and then, and then just fallen flat on their faces, just terribly fall, huge falls. And I'm not suggesting I'll ever go to those kind of levels. I'm not even suggesting that at all. I have no desire to do that, unless God did that. I have no desire, but I, I don't want to go there and fall. I, I want to be dead before I ever get there. I, I want to be famous after I'm dead. Does that make sense? I want to be famous after I'm dead. There should be a sermon on that. Lord, make me famous after I'm dead. It, the only difference is we have the opportunity as Christians to be dead while we're still living. Um, this is I'm, I'm going to read this quote just for a second, and then I'm going to I'm going to read from the book. But uh, this is speaking about George Mueller. He knew that if his effort was successful, fame would come to him, and consequently, he waited in agony to know that God had killed Mueller sufficiently that he could trust him with the fame, necessary notoriety and fame and success it was, that this orphanage was bound to bring. It, uh, is that clear? Do I need to read it again? Or did you guys get it? You got it. it it's, uh, gosh, it's, it's incredible. And I just got a long ways to go. I, I got a long, long ways to go. And I don't know about you guys as individuals. I don't know if you have a long ways to go or not. But, uh, I've got a long ways to go. This was this is interesting. Um, I'm going to quote from this book. I don't like to do that too much because I know that uh, that can be kind of irritating to have somebody read to you unless you're uh, sitting in a nice warm room by a fire and you want to be read to. But um, uh, the, remembering that this was written in 1926. And he's speaking about some of the miracles that took place, the incredible miracles that took place, like uh, the John Knox and, you know, how uh, Mary Queen of Scott was going to kill him. And, uh, or, and uh, she wanted to stop what he was doing. You know, sometimes we don't realize, in those days it was much more evident. You know, power was in religion and, and Mary Queen of Scott controlled the... I think they, is she the one they call Bloody Mary? I'm not sure, but Mary Queen of Scott, they, she was bent on destroying and, and killing uh, John Knox during the Great Reformation that was taking place in Scotland, and she did not want it to happen. She did not want people to get saved. She did not want, you know, and, and we look at some of the political things that go on in our country today, and, and we wonder what motivates these people. But, but there's a decision someplace, there's a decision made in people's lives that they're absolutely going to give themselves over to, to hell and, and all the things of Satan. And I don't know what level that happens at. I don't know who, who that's happened to. I'm not, going to. I'm not going to accuse any political person of that. But at what point do, do they, does hell take over in their lives in such a place as... And, and this was much more obvious in that, that, that she was trying to kill, that she was trying to find some way to kill Knox, John Knox, and um, it says, in the darkest hour of Reformation in Scotland, Mary, Queen of Scots, came 
onto the scene and threatened to overturn all that the great reformer John Knox had thus accomplished. For days, Knox agonized before God in believing prayer. Mary finally left Scotland, falling into the hands of Queen Elizabeth and was of England and was in prison. There was a there was a lull in the matter until news reached Scotland that Mary was about to be released. And all knew that if she returned to Scotland, she would endeavor to stop the Reformation there and have Knox killed. And again, Knox betook himself to agonizing prayer. He pleaded for Scotland and begged God to intervene. And I read that and I say, do we plead for America? Do we plead for God to intervene in America? I mean, seriously, plead. Here's one man pleading. Do we plead for God to intervene? Do we, do we agonize in tears and prayer and say, oh God, please, please save our country, save this land, save, save the people in America? Do we do that? Do we ever agonize in prayer like that? But it says he pleaded for Scotland and begged God to intervene. And one day of fasting found him in the garden of his home in hours of agony before the throne of God. And at last he came in with a joyful look on his face and said, God has answered. He just, he was, it was fine. God had answered. He explained, Scotland is delivered. In what way was asked? And he says, I don't know. I have no clue, he answered. But I know that God has totally lifted my burden and Scotland is safe. It was learned later that it was on that very day that Mary Queen of Scots was executed. Queen Elizabeth suddenly changed her mind and signed a death warrant and had her executed that day. You know, it's amazing what, and I'm not suggesting we pray for the execution of any of our political leaders or anything like that, but, but what do we pray? He said, I, I don't know how it happened. He says, I just know that we're delivered. I, I know it's over. And, and I wonder if, if we prayed like that, if we prayed, if we sought God like that, I, I, I'm not sure. Let me read this because this, uh, this furthers the thought. It says, our chief difficulty today seems to be that we can scarcely bring ourselves to become desperate in the matter of putting the cause of salvation across. The circumstances of our lives are so convenient, we live so comfortably, we are so protected on every side, cushions, rocking chairs, deeply upholstered autos abound, food is plentiful, danger for the most part is at a distance, electricity floods our homes with light, Luxurious trains with diners and sleepers bear us swiftly across the country. Not much is exacted of us that is grinding, hard, or taxing, and our faith has grown flabby. That many cannot keep themselves decently saved, let alone uh, endeavoring to accomplish anything in their Christian life. Isn't that interesting? I, I thought this. He said life is so comfortable, it, it, it's, it's a wonder that some of us can keep ourselves decently saved. I wonder what you think of America and the church in America today. We look for a Christianity that moves along the lines of least resistance, that disturbs us not, that continues to lull us to sleep, and to keep things easy. Our efforts at achievement are largely damned because the innate laziness, the innate laziness that has afflicted the age, and through the age entered into the fiber of our own souls, our faith becomes infected with ease-loving tendencies of time, and we cannot offer a perfect channel for achievement to God, and hence we, hence the mighty commissions of His Word means little or nothing to us. The mighty commissions of His Word means little or nothing to us. When He states that He that believeth on Me, the works that I do shall He also. We gape and wonder, and the church tries to imagine a variety of things that this could mean other than what it actually says. I love that. Isn't that cool? That is cool. He that believe on me the works I do, he shall do also. And we gave and wonder, and the church tries to imagine a variety of things that this could mean other than what it actually says. Is that the church today in America? Is that the church? We're, we're trying to, we're, well, that's not what that really means. That's not, you know, this is what he probably meant by that. It just says that. The works that I do, he shall also do, and then it, it, he doesn't finish the quote in the book, but it says, and greater works. Yeah, we, we, we try to imagine a variety of things this could mean other than what it actually says. And then relapse again into our spiritual comatose condition and sleep on. 
Little wonder that Jesus said, when the Son of Man cometh again, will he find any faith on earth? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, these are powerful words. These are powerful words that probably aren't even read in the Nazarene church anymore today. And this is one of the founders of it. You know, somehow, church, we've got to we got to get to that point that uh, we're sufficiently dead that God can operate through us. That's an interesting thought. Sufficiently uh, placed on the altar uh, as a living sacrifice that we might be in a position that God can actually operate through us. Luke eighteen twenty seven says, and he said, the things which are impossible to men are possible with God. You know, I can't humble myself, but maybe, just possibly, God can humble me. So as I pray, you know, let us pray that we that we have a heart for America, that we have a heart for our community, we have a heart such that we, we put we put those things above our own uh, our own pride, our own fear of being embarrassed, our own fear of rejection. Uh, I don't think anybody's gonna physically retaliate retaliate against us, but we just we just hate to. Uh... I thought it was interesting as that as Vicky sang last night, and sang Amazing Grace with such power, it was just incredible. That she may have. I wonder what she thought as she sang that in that room. She may have thought that here was my birthday, and the people that were in the in the room with me were, and there was about ten, twelve of us, and, and maybe she thought the people in that room were believers like me. Because here I was a pastor. Maybe these were people from my church that came for my birthday, not realizing that that most of the people in that room um, actually had looks of disgust on their face as she sang that amazing grace. They politely clapped when she got done because it was such a powerful rendition of it. Um, but I looked at their faces as she sang it, and some of them were just disgusted to hear that amazing grace. And, and they're, they're all about my age or within 10 years of me. And I think to myself, there's a couple in there that, that, that uh, are saved, but I, I think to myself, uh, what, what, you know, what's to come of those hearts? What's to come of those lives? That this woman would sing such clarity, such beauty, uh, this, this song about amazing grace. And uh, I mean, her voice and pitch, everything was just perfect, and, and and it didn't crackle at all. Yet it was just, man, it's like a loudspeaker. And uh, and the disgust, and, and the and some people just had a look of, oh, I'll tolerate this for a minute. You could just see it written on their faces. And and you wonder what. What goes on in these hearts? What's what's going on in these people's hearts that they would be so disgusted of such a beautiful demonstration of God's power and love through a, a person who'd suffered? And they, and they knew her story. They knew what she'd gone through to get where they where she was, and yet they were annoyed that she was taking their time. And uh, you know, what does America come to? Are we, you know, are we willing to agonize over those lost lives? Yeah, I want to tell you two things about myself. Is is what I'm faced with is two things. One, am I going to get rejected because I share the gospel with these people, and and I try to overcome that. I, I try hard to be a quote unquote extrovert so that I I overlook that rejection. But still, you don't like to be rejected. But the the other thing is I I struggle with is God powerful enough? And this is this is an awful thought. But is God powerful enough to penetrate these hard, stone hard hearts? You know, there, there probably a generation ago, if Vicky would have sang that in, in a group of people that went to their Lutheran church or their, Mil or their Methodist or Presbyterian church, you know, that they would have really enjoyed it. Not maybe for the, the spiritual side of it, but just the, the tonal quality and, and her ability to sing that beautiful song. They would have just enjoyed it a generation ago. Um, they may not have been any more saved or any less saved. They may not even in their hearts have responded. But there would have been an outward evidence that they enjoyed the fact that this lady 
had such incredible talent and was able to to uh, to demonstrate it in a in a godly way. He had to look at the faces last night and see the hardness and the, and the gosh, I got to tolerate this. I don't want to hear this. And you know, I, I don't know what's going on in somebody's hearts. I won't. I won't. But but they weren't grinning and enjoying it. And the believers were grinning from ear to ear and enjoying it. Um, but, but the other ones were just like disgusted. And I thought to myself, you know, hey, hey, where have we come in America? Where have we come in America that we wouldn't even, in a sense, be polite? I don't know if they would have clapped if I hadn't clapped. I clapped and then everybody followed in applause. But um, what, you know, what's, uh, what's going on in America? But I think we have to be real careful, church, that we don't harden our hearts. That we don't harden our hearts to a point where, where we're not listening to what God is doing. Matthew 5.48 says, Therefore be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I can't do that. I can't do that. Therefore be perfect, even as your Father in heaven. And it says in Matthew 19.26, <laughs> But Jesus beheld him and said unto them, With men this is impossible. With God all things are possible. Now obviously this is out of context 14 chapters later, but, but it's the same thing. If, if you're going to be perfect, how are you going to be perfect? It's, it's impossible with men, but it's possible with God. Can we, can we get to a place where we truly believe God does this stuff? Here we are in the first century, and he's writing to the Galatians in 3.1. He says, O foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? You not, who, who bewitched you not to obey the truth? To whom before your eyes Jesus Christ was written among you, crucified? This only I would learn from you. Did you receive a spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? The first century church, some of them had actually seen Jesus crucified, knew that he had re that he resurrected for their salvation. Some of them made him saw him resurrected and gone up that day and ascended that day. I, I don't know. But he goes on in, in verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Do you now perfect yourselves in the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it is even in vain? Then in he... Jesus supplying the Spirit to you and working powerful works in you, is it by works of law or by hearing of faith? You know, has God done something in us, church, that we can actually go do something about it? Not in the flesh, and that's, that's where the problem is. They were headed towards doing things in the flesh. And church, by and large, in America today is doing things in the flesh. They're doing things, they're doing things that entertain, they're doing things that draw people, they're, they're doing things that fill churches, that draw crowds. But rarely is it heard that, that people are preaching a message of, 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 of repentance and do something with your lives. You're going to hell. We're not even, I don't even know that the church is so convinced that a hell exists. We'll say that hell exists because that's, that's our doctrine, that's our belief, that's, that's our tenets of faith. We'll, we'll believe that hell exists. But in our actions, as we, as we approach people that are destined to hell, we put our, ourselves above them in the sense that we don't want to be rejected. We're afraid that they won't like us anymore. We're afraid that the door will close and we won't be able to... We're afraid that the Word of God doesn't really go forth to do what it's said it'll do. Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water to repentance, but he who comes after me, this is John the Baptist speaking, but he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is the fire in the church today? Where is that in our lives? Where is that in our testimony? Where is that as we're driven to, to go? And, and I'm not, this is not guilt. This is grace. The grace of God wants to give us the ability to do this. But I, I think by and large, we're not convinced that he really is going to do that or that the, the hearts are too hard that we can't do that. I don't know which it is. I was disgusted last night that some of those people, the looks on their faces, I, I was disgusted. And that's not the right emotion. The emotion I should have had is, is brokenness and weeping before God when I get home and say, oh my gosh, if they harden their hearts so far that you can't save their souls. And, and rather, I have kind of an indifference that, well, if they want to go to hell, let them go to hell. 
And, and you know, I'm saying that because I'm just being honest. Acts 1 4, having met with him, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to await the promise of the Father, which you heard from me, for God, for John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Acts 1 4. Jesus met with him, he said, Don't even go try and do this on your own. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, don't even try and go and do this. You know, Peter came out of that meeting filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke to thousands, tens of thousands maybe, and 3,000 were saved that day. If he had gone out on his own, I don't know what would have happened. But he waited for the Holy Spirit. How much do we actually wait for the Holy Spirit? How much do we actually spend time? We're so busy, like, it just, like I just read that book. That was 1926. We're so much more busier than that. He didn't, he didn't even have a perspective of how busy we'd be doing everything. We're so, our lives are so involved with things that we think we must do that have to be done, that need to be done. Acts 1.8, he says, But you shall receive power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. How's that working for us? Most of church growth in America today is transfer growth. You know, it, people leave this church and go to the high school church and and, uh, and I'm not being critical of them. I, I'm just saying that, that we're not really we're not really seeing desperate people come to the Lord. We, oftentimes we don't even, you know, my, my first thought was when Vicki said she didn't have transpiration, I thought, well, who, who will go get her? Who, who in our church will take the time to go get her? And, and praise God, I thought of every one of you, and I thought every one of you would do, would do that. You'd go get her. She was amazed that we even considered that somebody would come and get her from North Omaha and bring her to Plattsmouth, Nebraska. I hope she calls. I, I would be so blessed if she calls. I didn't, I didn't feel it was appropriate to ask for her information. That's private. That's her business. And, and she would have felt compelled to give it to me had I asked for it. So I didn't do that. But she took my card. It's got the phone number on it. And, and I hope she calls because I hope she does come and give a witness of what God's doing in her life. You know, it's interesting. I, I thought to myself when she said all that, I thought, you know, should I invite her or not? And I thought, you know, has God really done this? Is she just talking? Or is she, you know, obviously the burns are there. And, and uh, I thought, what if she comes and talks at our church and we found out that she's living with some guy or something? You know, all these thoughts go over her head. You know, the thing that was missing is the power of God. She was telling me about the power that God had in her life and what he'd done. And, and I, I begin to intermix it with questions and doubts. Where does that junk come from? Where does that junk come from? Thank God for Vicky. Thank God for what he's done in her life. Thank God that she put herself before her, or put her neighbors before herself and went into that fire and, and rescued people and got burned herself. Thank God there's people like that. Thank God that she walked through her stroke and, and, and got herself right again in and she just kept giving God the praise, God the praise. She says, I'm a changed person. I'll never go back. I don't want to go back to my old life. Hallelujah. Is that exciting or what? That's just exciting. And, and I don't want that anymore where, where doubts and, and questions flood. Because it's not Vicky. It's the power of God in Vicky that has done this to her. It's not Vicky. And should Vicky slip and slide? Maybe that maybe we've had too much of the, the Bakers and Swaggerts and stuff like that. Maybe we just had too much of the Haggerts and maybe we just had too much of that, that slipping. And we look to these people and then we see them slip. You know, it, it's the power of God. And that's what that's what he was saying to the Galatians. Quit relying on yourself. Rely on the power of God. We need to get the power of God in our lives. Galatians 3.22, but the scriptures shut up all under sin so that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The promise of faith by Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. God is going to give us what we need. God is going to give the church what he needs. We just have to, we have to just kind of so soak ourselves, saturate ourselves in the truth that, that there's no room for unbelief anymore in our thinking. Our, our minds have a limited capacity, praise God. That means that, that there's only so much room in there and, and mine sometimes seems like it has less than most others, but but you know there's there's only so much room in there, 
And if we can fill that and saturate that with truth and belief, that there won't be room for the doubt and those ugly thoughts that come. But it says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, having been shut up to faith of, that was about to be revealed, so that the law has become a schoolmaster of us until Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Yeah, the law is there, but it was only to protect us until and guide us, take us down the right path to some extent. You know, it, it was to prepare people. You know, I talked about a, a minute ago, I talked about how God left the, the ark open for seven days after, after he took all the animals and Noah and everybody was in there. He left the door open for seven days. Really, the, the question is, was it open to, to allow others in? Maybe, possibly, but nobody came. But God left that door open. You know, God has an open door, and, and today His open door is the church. And, and if we don't invite people, you know, I, I don't know if Noah stood at the door and called people in and said, man, you better get in here. You, you're dead meat if you don't get in here. I, I don't know. It doesn't say that. But we know that we're, we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to take the gospel to, to what did it say, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends there. We're supposed to do that with the power of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to stand there with the door open uh, until it's too late. We're to stand there with that door open. And we're to call out, whether Noah did, I don't know, but we're to call out. We're to stand by that door to heaven, that, that last hope that people have. And maybe like Noah, nobody else will walk through. Maybe nobody in our lives will ever walk through that door. But that does not release us from the responsibility of doing it. I think unbelief just gets so in the way. Doubt for me, doubt and unbelief gets so in the way. I don't doubt that God can't reach everybody that He wants to reach. My doubt is whether any of them will ever open their hearts to Him. But that's not my business. That's not my business. Our business, I was thinking about the doctor, the cardiologist that did my, did my operation as I, as I go through this thing over and over again at night trying to get it down to 40 minutes as I go over and whether I ever go to that big church or not I ought to get it down to 40 minutes anyhow and and as I go through that I think about the doctor and, and how his wife said man all he does is read the Bible and talk about Jesus now since this happened to me and it, it, it's it's interesting I thought well maybe I should go back and find him and talk to him more but the Bible says some plant, you know, some plant the seed, some water the seed, but the Holy Spirit brings the increase. It says in here, His word won't fall void. If I ever have the opportunity to run into Him again, then I will share with Him and see where He is with, with Christ. But, but it says His word won't fall void. And if that man is, is outwardly studying Jesus enough that his wife realizes it, then then God will do what needs to be done. Our part is to plant that seed. Our part is to water that seed. It's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that brings the increase. And I just encourage you, church, that you that you would begin to do that. But I encourage you to wait upon the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to spend the time with God, the intimacy with the Lord. I mean, don't don't stay there so long that you never go out. But like that song in the garden, it says, you know, there's a point where you just you're spending time with him alone in the garden. It's just wonderful, but there's a time where, where the conditions of the world on the outside just cause you to go out. 325 says, but faith coming, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For many as were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. How incredible are those words? Yet do we embrace the power of those words? It says, it says, for you are all sons of God through Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. How do, do we believe that? I'm a son of God. I'm a son of God that he so loves that he gave his own son, his first, the, the, the second born in a sense, after Adam, that Christ came and died for me so that I could be brought back to be with God again. 
How real is that to us? That's what we have to really focus on is how real is it that I am, I am a child of God and no matter what comes, it, it, it's, by, it's by His design that whether I come to suffering, whether I come to, to success in this world, whether I'm able to go to churches of thousands or whether, whether you're able to go to churches of thousands. Maybe, maybe it's not me. Maybe I'll die and one of you will pick up the mantle and, and you'll go to churches of thousands. I don't know. But God wants the message out that He's desiring to be intimate with His church and they don't want it. I think if we knew and really believed the value of it, the value of being sons and daughters of God, if we, if we really understood the value of being sons and daughters of the creator of the universe, if we really understood the value of that, that we, we would just press in to get all that we can. We're almost done, but Galatians 5, 16 says, I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. Thus, whatever you may will, these things you do. And, you know, that's a whole sermon in itself, and I'm not going to go there. I went there last week, but I want to talk about that just for a second. It says, lest whatever you may will, these things you do. When sin knocks at the door, do you break into tongues because you do not want that sin to come into your life? When the temptation to gossip, when the temptation to lust, when the temptation to, to have what, what's beyond what you need to have, when those temptations come, do you rebuke the enemy and, and begin to pray in the Spirit? When God tells you, give a certain amount of money to someone or some minister or something and, 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 and they, well, I can't really do that. I really can't afford that right now. You know, yada, yada, yada. Or do we say, I won't accept that. God's my provider. I'm the son of God. And if he says do that, then I'm going to go do it. And, and whatever the chips may fall, let them fall. But I've got plenty. I've got all I need and more. Romans 8, we're, we're almost done. 8 1, there's no therefore no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to flesh, but according to the Spirit. And, and that's got to be, that has got to be, for me, for you, I hope, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about it, 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 that has got to be our purpose in life, is to walk after the Spirit. Just so concentrate on walking after the Spirit, so focused on walking after the Spirit. That when sin knocks at our door, when, when doubt and unbelief knock at our door, when, when failure knocks at our door, that we say, hey, I, I won't accept that. I will not accept those thoughts. I'm going to take those thoughts captive. And I'm going to begin to pray in the Spirit. I'm not anymore going to allow those kinds of thoughts to come into my head. I'm not going to judge people anymore. I'm not going to be critical of people anymore. You know, seeing the discerning, I'll use that word, discerning the faces last night of the people could, could result in one or two things for me. It could result in me judging those people and saying their hearts are so hard they don't really want God, they don't want God. Or my, that discernment that God has given me to see the looks on their faces could have turned to weeping for me and, and brokenness and say, God, open some doors, give me an opportunity before they die. They're in their 60s and 70s, you know. Give me an open door, Lord. Somehow soften their spirit. Somehow do something, God, that I might be able to be part of what you need. And if it's not me, then somebody else. But somehow, God, reach these people before they go to a, 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 an eternal damnation. Please, God. Please, God. Please, please, please. Or do we say, oh, gosh, their hearts are so hard. Look at, them. Look at the looks on their faces. This beautiful woman singing and and they're, they're almost mocking her by the looks on their faces as they look at each other, you know, they shoot looks at each other. It's so easy to fall into judgment. It's much more difficult to fall into agonizing prayer and agonizing desire to see people's lives change. Who do you know? Who do you know that, that, that you just know that you know that they're, they're in trouble, that they're not where they should be? Who do you know that you should be in agonizing prayer over, that you should be weeping for? Or have we gone 
grown too complacent that we just don't do that. 2 Corinthians 3.17, I'm really getting close. And the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He said, walk according to the Spirit. And, and then he says, and the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with our face having been unveiled, having beheld the glory of God, as in a mirror, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Lord's Spirit. Oh God, that's my prayer. That's my prayer as, as I walk in that spirit that Paul said I should walk in. Knowing that the Lord is that spirit and the, and the spirit of the Lord has brought me liberty. And that I so enjoy that liberty that I can see unveiled faces. I can see the glory of God. I can, I can go boldly to his throne. I can see the glory of God. I can see the presence of God. I can see the power of God. That he changes me into the image of His Son, by glory to glory. And it's no longer me that lives, but Christ that lives in me. That is my desire. God, do that. But Judy warns us in 120, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, eagerly awaiting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to everlasting life. Keep yourself built up, church. Keep yourself in, in, in spiritual prayer. Keep yourself built up in intimacy with the God, with, 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 with the God who created you. Keep yourself built up. Because as it says in Luke 137, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. I printed this out today, my message. I printed this message out just on a but in a sense, a piece of scrap paper that I had in the printer would actually even have holes punched in it. And, and it's because I, I printed a map of the United States and where we've been already with this message. And, and I'm not realizing that I, I just printed my message out because I don't like to waste paper. So uh, the other one's a test strip that I checked. I put a new cartridge in. And here's a print of the United States. And, and, and I know you can't see this on the camera well, but but you, you'd see, if you could see it, there's, there's stars of every state we've been to, in some states repeatedly, but a star in every state we've been to, 34 states. Everywhere from Delaware, to Hawaii, Alaska, all these states, everything really, everything to the west of, of the, the eastern time zone and some even across the line. And as I look at this and I see, I see there's only 16 states left to reach. 16 states left to reach. I, I look at that and I say, how in God's name, if I can use that terminology, has that been accomplished today? How in, how in, in any realistic thought, and I'm not talking about some whirlwind tour, I'm talking about year after year after year, month after month after month, getting in a vehicle and driving to a state, getting in a plane and flying to a state. And I am encouraged by God, I am encouraged by God that this ministry that He gave me in 1999, so many years ago, what is that? 14 years ago. I think that's interesting because Paul says, 14 years ago I was in the Spirit. I don't know if I was in the Spirit or in the Bible. 14 years ago, I got this message. And, and I just ask you, I seriously ask you, not in criticism, not in condemnation, but I seriously ask you, has God given you something has God given you something to do with your life that will impact America? Will it impact the body of Christ? That will impact what you've been called? It, what have you been called to? What have you been called to? I look at, uh, at an almost empty church. And then I look at this map. 34 states. 
How has that happened? Some of those are so far away. How has it happened that, that pastors have even opened the door for the message? It's not by me. It's by the Spirit of God. And there's so much more to be done. There is so much more to be done. And I personally, and I don't know about you guys, but I personally have to take a huge, giant step into the death of Jim Nielsen. Because I'm coming in the last years of, of, of my existence on this planet, and, and I am going to accomplish what God has called me to accomplish, but I'm beginning to realize that that will be nothing but vapor. This map will be nothing but vapor unless the Spirit of God has done it. And I've got to get to a position, if you pray for your pastor, pray. Pray that I just die. That I just die. Because I want to be famous after I'm dead. Think about it. Father, I praise you and I give you the glory. You're worthy of all praise and honor. I never know what you're doing. I, I never quite understand it. And praise God for that. It probably wouldn't do me well if I did. Teach me to trust you. Teach us all to trust you. Teach us all to discover what that is that we're called to do. And in the face of rejection, in the face of failure, let our faith just go right through that and penetrate it no matter what comes, no matter what happens. That we walk on, we walk on, we walk on. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Is there a last song we can play?